Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for UW Extension Cooperative Extension. And on behalf of those folks and their other co-organizers, Wisconsin Public Television, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight's rather special because this is a Wednesday night about the lab, and this is about the Labrador Retriever and a particular type of degenerative polyneuropathy that that breed and other t types of dogs get. Our speaker tonight is Susanna Sample. She's with the School of Veterinary Medicine. She was born in Hinsdale, Illinois and grew up in LaGrange. She went to Lyons Township High School in the suburbs there. Went to Northwestern University and got a, her undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering. Then she came up here to Wisconsin where she got her master's uh, her DVM and her PhD and then just last year uh, she became a board certified veterinary surgeon. So I'm looking forward to hearing about One Health Medicine, a naturally occurring dog model of degenerative <coughs> polyneuropathy. Please join me in welcoming Susanna Sample to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Introduction. To go through a quick um, outline of what I'm going to talk about tonight, I was going to start by discussing a little bit about canine genetics and genome-wide association studies, uh, followed by a discussion about this condition that I'm studying in dogs, um, which I call acquired laryngeal paralysis polyneuropathy. Um, some people will just refer to it as LARPAR um, more commonly. Um, I'm going to go through a few basic definitions about genetics and genomics to get everyone on the same page um, to explain what we're doing and why and then discuss our genetic study and a little bit about future directions. So to start, um, when you talk about canine genomics and genome-wide association studies, dogs have really become um, more prevalent in this area. And so I'm gonna talk a bit about why dogs are really great models. In 2010, there was this paper that came out with the title, Man's Best Friend is Biology's Best in Show. And I just think that that's a really great encompassing title to talk about the idea that dogs are really important when it comes to comparative genomic research. And the reason for this is that when you talk about purebred dogs, they're a very highly inbred group of animals. Selective breeding has created over 400 breeds, and most of this has happened within even just the last few hundred years. And as a consequence of this, we have a very high prevalence of breed-specific diseases. Ultimately, this really, when you think about it, is humanity's greatest genetic experiment. It started you know, thousands of years ago when we first took gray wolves and domesticated them into what's referred to now as village dogs. And over the last few hundred years, taken those dogs and created dog breeds to the extent that you end up with you know, a situation where you've got this little guy and a Great Dane that are actually the same species. And when you really sit back and think about that, it's a pretty amazing phenotypic or, or visual diversity um, within, within dogs. So importantly, when you think about canine genomics or genetics, the canine and the human genome are actually very similar. So at this point, about 92% of genes that we know of in people have been mapped in dogs, um, and that's obviously increasing over time. Another important feature is that people and their dogs share a common environment, so environmental influences are obviously quite similar. And most diseases that we see in dogs do have a corresponding disease in humans. So talking about one of these diseases is acquired laryngeal paralysis polyneuropathy. So like I mentioned, um, in the world, a lot of people call this disease LARPAR. Um, and it's most commonly what we call an idiopathic degenerative polyneuropathy. So what that means, idiopathic means we have no idea what causes it. Degenerative means obviously it's something that degenerates over time. And polyneuropathy means a disease of many nerves. About 70% of these cases occur in Labrador retrievers. Um, the next most common breed, at least in the United States, are golden retrievers. Um, rarely dogs can get laryngeal paralysis from other causes. Most commonly that's gonna be from a tumor, maybe in their neck or from some sort of surgical trauma. Technically speaking, um, endocrine diseases like diabetes or hypothyroidism could cause a disease like this, but that's not really been well documented. 
in Labrador retrievers, the age of onset or presentation is very typical. So they tend to be about 11, maybe 12 years of age. And owners usually report that they've noticed a change over the past year. And it strongly resembles certain neuropathic conditions in people. So the example I'm going to use tonight is a disease condition called Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease. So talking a little bit about Charcot-Marie Tooth, it's the most common inherited polyneuropathy in people or peripheral neuropathy in people. And what that means is it's a disease of nerves that aren't necessarily coming in your spinal cord or your brain, but they, they come from those places. So they're what's innervating your body from your cord or from your brain. And it's actually relatively common. It affects about 1 in 2,500 people in the United States. It ends up having a progressive degeneration of motor and sensory nerves. So these people tend to experience muscle atrophy. They have chronic pain. They have hand and foot deformities like you see in that picture there. And interestingly and importantly, it's the longest nerves in the body that tend to be the most affected. So in people, those nerves are usually what innervates your distal limbs, so your hands or your feet. Um, obviously progressing over time. There are a lot of different subtypes. So when you think about Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease, you have to realize it's an umbrella term. So it's a, it's a disease term for a typical presentation that is caused by a lot of different genetic mutations. So I may have CMT and someone else may have CMT in the audience, but what's causing that would be two different genes. So at this point, there's over 80 genes that are associated with it. Now, there are some that are a lot more common than others. So there's four genes responsible for most of the genetically diagnosed versions of this disease. But not all cases have been found, and we haven't found a genetic cause for every type of case. And the other important part of this is that most forms are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. That's not always true, um, but the vast majority of them are a dominant disease. There's no disease-modifying therapy currently available for people with this condition, and so the treatment ends up being symptomatic. So we support help, help to support people with disabilities, or you treat muscle cramps or spasms or pain. One of the big concerns you have with any time you're dealing with a, a neuropathic disease is that when you talk about drug trials, there's obviously a lot of ethical concerns that come up about the idea of trying drugs that affect your nervous system. Um, particularly when you're dealing with children. Now, Charcot-Marie Tooth can affect children, but generally it's thought of as being a middle-aged to older disease because it's progressive over time. So people tend to start having signs that really affect their life when they're a bit older. And like I said, not all genetic underpinnings are identified. So one question we have is, is this disease we talk about in dogs a potential model for a condition in people? So let's talk about laryngeal paralysis. Like I said, it's a... It, when you look at this clinically, you can see signs of a peripheral polyneuropathy. So again, nerves not from not your cord or your brain, but nerves coming from those places that are affecting those nerves that are longest in the body. Now in the dog, the two longest nerves you have are the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which I have no idea why, but it, it, it's true in people too. This exits your, your brain, it comes down, it wraps around your heart, and then comes all the way back up to innervate your larynx. So on a giraffe, this thing's like eight feet long. Um, <laughs> it's the most redundant nerve ever. Um, and the other long nerve you have is, is the nerves in dogs that innervate their hind limbs. Those are another very long nerve. So when you look at these um, clinical findings, dogs end up with laryngeal paralysis, which is their larynx or voice box is paralyzed. They can end up with respiratory distress. Their esophagus isn't going to have correct mobility anymore. And you end up with problems with your hind limbs too. So clinically we see hind limb weakness and decreased reflexes in the back legs. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about all of those in a moment. But clinically, when people come in with their dogs having this disease, the first thing to realize is that dogs don't ever exhibit symptoms. They exhibit clinical signs. So what that means is a dog can't tell you if when they're eight, if they're feeling tingly feelings in their paws, right? They can't tell you if their stomach hurts or if they're nauseous. Instead, they vomit, right? So they show you the clinical sign that they're not feeling good, but they can't tell you, you know, three hours beforehand, like, I don't really feel so good. Um, so consequently, we don't really have a way of identifying this potentially earlier on until there's really a major problem where these nerves aren't working at all. The typical progression when owners report in Labradors is usually relatively slow for months to years. They start noticing a few changes. Um, and usually it's the changes associated with the voice box or the larynx that are the most noticeable. So oftentimes dogs have a voice change where instead of barking normally they have a very hoarse bark. 
Um, maybe they won't want to exercise quite as much. They end up with very loud breathing. And in very severe situations, they can end up in extreme respiratory distress. They can turn blue, which we call cyanosis, and potentially even collapse. High limb weakness is also often noted when you start talking to owners about it, but unfortunately, it's often misinterpreted or misdiagnosed. These are older dogs, so the hips get blamed a lot. Um, if they have hip dysplasia or old dog arthritis or they're just slowing down when really they, they have a neuropathy that's affecting their mobility. On examination findings, you see severe upper respiratory noise and like I said, some neurologic <coughs> exam findings you can find. So I'm going to go through all of these. Um, they have absent paw replacement tests, so I'll show you what that means. Um, decreased withdrawal reflexes, um, and I'll discuss that and then also show you some images of a dog with hind limb weakness. So the severe upper respiratory distress or noise and, and potential respiratory distress is something that you can generally hear these dogs coming down the block. They sound something around Darth Vader slash train. And so I'm going to play a, a video of this. And you have to realize that this dog, it's not like this dog's just been exercising. He was just sitting down and stood up. So you get a sense of how noisy he really is. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. So, you know, later on in the disease, these dogs are actually relatively obvious <laughs> when they have the disease because you can hear it. Um, other things that you see are laryngeal paralysis on exam. So these are images of a larynx, and they're taken through a small camera that we actually use to look inside abdomens of dogs. So the resolution's not great, and I apologize. But to get you oriented, we're looking down the throat of a dog. So up here is the esophagus, that little crease right here. This is the trachea inside that dark hole, and these are cartilage that is associated with the voice box. This is a tongue depressor. Um, so to give you a sense when, of a normal dog, when they breathe in, you'll see that, whoops, that's not it. When they breathe in, the larynx opens, right? So normally when you breathe in, these sort of double doors open up, um, and then close. So I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. I'm coughing, I'm breathing in, I'm breathing out. So in a dog that's paralyzed, I don't know how well you can see this, but there's a little bit of mucus right here. And so you can see that move when the dog breathes. And you'll notice that the larynx is not moving at all. So he breathes in and nothing's really happening. And that's all to do with this recurrent laryngeal nerve. Another sign we see are the paw replacement tests. So normally, if you take the hind limb of a dog and their paws and you flip them over, they should flip right back. So dogs that have this condition oftentimes don't do that. So you can see that this dog, if you flip his paws over, it's just not really connecting that that's happened and they don't flip them back. Another sign, and this is a little hard to see, but it's decreased withdrawal reflexes. So I'm going to show you a normal dog, and then I'm going to show you a dog that has decreased reflexes. So this is a dog that's or withdrawal reflex. So what I'm going to do first with this dog is show you what a normal range of motion, range of motion is. So this is what he should do. You pinch his toe, he should pull back, and all of his joints should flex. So you can see that his ankle flexes, his knee flexes, and his, hock, and his hip flexes. It's the, same, it's the same reflex that if you touch a hot stove, you pull your hand back. That's not something that goes all the way up to your brain and back. That's a local reflex. And if you ever have the opportunity to do this, you'll notice that your, your, your wrist, your elbow, and your shoulder all flex back. So that's normal. So in a dog that has um, this condition, what ends up happening, oh, is they go away. So I'm going to, again, I've shown normal. So that's how he should flex his leg. And what you'll notice is he kicks back when you pinch his toe. So he doesn't flex this joint correctly. Ah, he's really not flexing it. Computer's touchy. So he kicks back. And that's because his hock's not innervated or his ankle um, isn't having normal innervation. Lastly, you start seeing hind limb weakness. So when you watch a dog walk normally, you can notice that he's trotting in a very sort of graceful way. 
He's flexing his joints correctly. When he puts his feet down, they're not totally under his body, but they're, they're you know, in an appropriate place. That's really a normal trotting dog. Now, when you see a dog that's weak, what you'll notice is that he walks in a very stiff-gated manner. He's not really flexing his joints correctly. He's maybe a little bit more of a wide base stance, and that all just has to do with them being relatively weak. So these are very classic signs that we can see on neurologic exam. Unfortunately, this can often become an emergency, particularly when you have owners who just aren't aware that this, their dog has this condition. They don't appreciate that maybe these things aren't just old dog changes. And this particularly happens when dogs are excited and it's high temperatures. So their respiratory rate goes up, they start panting. That airway flow and flow of oxygen going by actually causes some trauma almost to the laryngeal mucosa, which is just like the cheek, like inside your cheek. So you can imagine it swells relatively quickly. It becomes inflamed, starts to swell. The dogs aren't breathing so well. Now they're really upset. And you end up in this sort of vicious cycle, which can, in very severe cases, end up with what we call severe dyspnea. In other words, a very difficult time breathing. They can end up with cyanosis. They turn blue because they're not getting enough oxygen. They can collapse. And because dogs cool themselves so much panting, they can end up with hypothermia and actually die of heat stroke. So unfortunately, this really is a life-limiting condition. The most common problem we have with dogs that die of this disease is that they get aspiration pneumonia. And what that means is essentially food goes down the wrong tube. And whether it's food going in, or actually most likely, what's more likely is they're actually getting regurge or esophageal reflux because their esophagus isn't working quite right. And now their larynx, which protects their airway, isn't working. And you can imagine that they can end up what we call silent aspiration, so they can end up with pneumonia. Sometimes that can be catastrophic to the point where there's really not much we can do. And sometimes it's something that just happens over and over again. And you have these older dogs that are in the hospital a lot and they're not able to live their dream. Um, on the flip side, you can have severe laryngeal swelling like I talked about where you will have dogs that die of heat stroke or you have dogs that die literally of suffocation. And sometimes what ends up happening is these dogs just degenerate to the point where they don't have the quality of life that they want to have. They can't chase their squirrel. You know, they can't go do the things that makes them wake up every morning and owners just say, he's not doing what he needs to do to be happy. So in terms of treatment options, there's, like Charcot Marie Tooth, there is no disease modifying treatment available. Um, we have two options. We have conservative management, and then we do have one surgical option. So conservative management usually um, involves weight loss to keep these dogs from getting so hot, um, stress management reduction so they don't get too excited, exercise restrictions obviously so they don't end up panting so much and avoiding high temperatures. Surgically, we can go and open up their airway to a degree, which essentially gives them sort of a rescue tube to breathe through, so hopefully they will never asphyxiate or suffocate or they'll never have a heat stroke event. And there's a number of different ways to do this. And if you put 10 surgeons in a room, you'll probably get eight opinions about which is the best. But generally what's done um, in 2016 is a cricoid or retinoid lateralization, which is commonly referred to as a tie back surgery. Um, there's other options as well. But what it essentially does is if you look at these images here, so we have the larynx again, up here is the esophagus, trachea again is here. So if you look at this opening in the trachea, what these procedures essentially do is open that up to a degree. So you can see that this area, which we call the glottic opening, is a little bit bigger. And it just gives them a rescue so they don't end up in those really dangerous situations. We talk about prognosis with these surgeries. Um, aspiration pneumonia is a complication. Um, and if you read through the literature of um, different lateralization procedures or opening procedures, on average, somewhere around 15 to 20% of dogs probably get aspiration pneumonia after the procedure in the immediate sort of few days. Um, now, not very many dogs die of that. They just need to be in the hospital a little bit longer. But you can have catastrophic aspiration events um, as a result of the surgery. They're very rare. But as soon as you see one happen, um, it makes you nervous. Unfortunately, we have no preoperative means of determining which dogs are going to get aspiration pneumonia postoperatively. So there's not really a good way to recommend to owners whether or not this surgery is something that's going to be more dangerous for their dog versus another. But you also need to keep in mind that aspiration pneumonia is also common in dogs that don't have this surgery. So 
um, it's kind of a complication of the disease in general. And these are two images of um, a thorax of a dog that shows you aspiration pneumonia. So this is a normal dog. So when you're looking at this, the head's this way, his little butt's that way. This is his heart, and so you're looking at his lungs, and this is his trachea coming down. And that's, that's really a normal thoracic radiograph. When you look at this dog, what you can see is that there's this area that's white and what looks almost like a tree coming out of that, and those are what we call air bronchograms. And essentially what causes that is when there's fluid in the lungs, the bronchus, which still has air in it, contrasts very well on these radiographs, and you can see sort of this tree-like pattern that occurs, and it's a very classic radiograph of what we call aspiration pneumonia, or any pneumonia. So the key points here is that laryngeal paralysis in dogs really is a devastating disease. It can be life-threatening. The clinical features indicate that it's a peripheral neuropathy. It's a similar to a number of human degenerative neurologic diseases, one of which I discussed with you today, and it really does have a potential to be a naturally occurring um, animal model of human peripheral neuropathies. This is one of the dogs in our study. He's very handsome. And apparently a winner. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about genetics. So um, stick with me, I'll, I'll try to make this as painless as possible. So we're gonna go back to like fifth grade and DNA. So um, DNA is the inheritance information of your body. And each strand is essentially made up of four bases. So A, G, T, and C. And each base um, essentially creates what's called a nucleotide. So a given nucleotide would be like A. And when you match A with its pair, which is T, you get a base pair. So A always pairs with T, C always pairs with G. That's the, the basic you need to know for the nucleotide, a base pair, and DNA. Secondly, the genome. So the genome is the entire set of DNA for any animal. You have to realize that about 99.9% .9 of it is exactly the same in a given species. The caveat of that is 0.1% is actually a lot of DNA um, because the DNA is, is huge, right? <coughs> so when you talk about um, DNA, oftentimes we'll discuss alleles, and alleles are alternative forms of DNA um, at a DNA segment at a given location in the genome. The way I always like to think of this conceptually is that from your mom and your dad, you get two alleles, right? So um, they're, you've got two, um, one from each parent. When I refer to the word locus, which I might slip into every once in a while, that essentially just refers to a place <coughs> in the DNA, all right? It's like a house, a location, a locus. Okay, I promise this is the last one. Genotypes versus phenotypes. So a genotype is a pair of alleles at a locus. And so you can be either a homozygote or a heterozygote. And a homozygote is when you inherit two identical versions of the allele from your parents, or a heterozygote is when you inherit two different alleles. And the phenotype is the observable characteristic as a result of the genotype. So just to bring back freshman year in high school, a great example of this is eye color. So when you look at brown eyes versus blue eyes, we probably all like drew this chart back in the day. You can either be a homozygote major, where you're big B, big B, and you get brown eyes, brown eyes being a dominant trait. You can be a heterozygote, where you're big B, little B, you end up with brown eyes because brown is dominant. Or you can be a homozygote minor, which is the minor allele, which is little B, little B, and you end up with blue eyes, because blue eyes is a recessive trait. So now that we've brought that flashback, um, let's get into something more fun. So genome-wide association studies, the entire point of this is to come up with a way to scan the genome and find the biologically significant variations um, that contribute to a trait or a disease. And when you think about this, it's really a very nascent field. So it wasn't even really thought of until the mid-90s. The human genome wasn't sequenced until 2001. It wasn't until 2005 that the first human GWAS came out. That same year, the canine genome was sequenced. And in dogs, our first GWAS came out six years ago. So this is really um, a relatively new field, but it's very rapidly evolving because it's been, I think, realized that it's a very powerful technology. So how this works, I'm gonna talk about SNPs and LD in more, in more um, detail in a minute, but essentially there's commercial arrays out, we call them SNP chips, um, that have a whole bunch of these SNPs scanned across the genome. 
and um, you, you send in DNA for these SNP chips and you get a whole bunch of data back and you can analyze them. And there's two real ways to approach GWAS. You can either do a case control association like I'm doing, so the dogs either have laryngeal paralysis or they don't, or you can do quantitative trait, um, trait association. So for instance, height. So are there some genes that are more correlated with being tall and other genes that are more correlated with being short? And the power of a SNP to detect an association is dependent on something called linkage disequilibrium. So SNPs in a simplified fashion, they're variations in a nucleotide base at a single locus in the genome. So in one spot in the genome, there are variation in this A, C, T, and G um, that's recognized within a species. So if you look at this here, um, essentially, this is, say, a strand of DNA, and here's three subjects, and here's a bunch of SNPs. So essentially, these arrays take a bunch of SNPs, and they put a scan throughout the genome, and I'll get back, say, three subjects. So it's SNP1, this, this subject is an AT, and this subject's an AA, and this subject's an AT. And then, it, obviously, you have that except for a few hundred thousand or million SNPs. Some of these SNPs are biologically significant, and some of them make absolutely no difference. So these studies essentially use these SNP markers, and like I said, they're just spread out across the genome. So what about linkage disequilibrium? Like, what, what, what does that mean? So when you think about linkage disequilibrium, the easiest way to conceptualize it is to realize that there are chunks of DNA that are inherited together. It's easiest to think about this in a linear fashion, like DNA is one big strand and there's big chunks that are inherited. In reality, sometimes these aren't even on the same chromosome. Um, sometimes they're pretty far away from each other on a given strand of DNA, but when you're thinking about it for now, just think about them as a chunk of DNA that's all heritage together. And you have very long chunks of DNA in new populations and shorter chunks in old populations, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The other thing to keep in mind is that purebred dogs are not bred randomly, right? There's nothing natural about a stud dog being bred 400 times in its life. So, um, you know, the lifetime matings for given dogs can be very high, and it just really highlights the idea that um, purebred dogs, their genetics and, and breeding are very controlled. All right, so this is the tough bit. These are called triangle plots, and they're really the easiest way to describe linkage disequilibrium. And the way to think about this is that it's like a heat map. So along this top area here are a bunch of SNPs. So RS is a common, and then a bunch of numbers behind it, is a common way of identifying a given SNP. And so within each one of these, what you can do is connect them. So here's SNP number three, and we're gonna connect it to SNP number nine, and you can see because it's sort of a reddish color, those two are in some degree of linkage. In other words, they're often inherited together. All right, so the more red you have within these plots, the more linkage disequilibrium exists. So to put that into context, when you look at human populations, you can see newer populations like <coughs> Caucasians, which in the history of humanity, Caucasians are actually a very young population, versus an ancient population like the Yorubans. And when you look at the difference in these maps, you can tell that the Caucasians have a whole lot more red than the Yorubans. So newer populations have higher linkage disequilibrium in these heat maps, they have more red because more of these chunks of DNA are inherited together and associated with each other. So that's people. So what about in dogs? Well, when you look at a Caucasian, you're like, yeah, there's a lot of red there. And then you look at a purebred dog and it's like red out, right? So, you know, purebred dogs have extremely high linkage disequilibrium. And that becomes important when you're doing genetic studies. <coughs> because within one of these blocks or chunks of DNA, when you're looking at SNPs and you're trying to find a disease, you only need, theoretically, one SNP within that block to determine, to, to tag a disease locus. So within here, if you're saying, here's my disease. So in humans, the disease is here, and in dogs, it's here. In order to find that disease in people, because they have smaller linkage disequilibrium, because their DNA isn't inherited in as big of chunks, you need all of these markers to try to find that, that particular mutation. Versus a dog, because you have bigger chunks of DNA, and you only need one of these markers in each chunk, <coughs> 
you end up with needing a whole lot less markers. And this is really reflected in these bead chips or chip SNP chips that I was telling you about that you can get commercially. So in people, their SNP chips have over 4 million SNPs across the human genome. Versus dogs, we're like really excited because we just got bumped up to 220,000. So you know, when you're looking at that, it really just gives you a sense of how fewer you know, markers you really need to look at this in dogs. So the key points of this is that genome-wide association studies are a means to scan the genome for variants that associate with a given disease or a given trait. And the power of GWAS is really influenced by linkage disequilibrium. So dogs have a very high linkage disequilibrium compared to people. And what this means is that when you're studying diseases in dogs, you need fewer sample si sizes, you need fewer dogs enrolled, and you need a lot less markers across the genome to try to find a problem. This is Bocce. It's fabulous. Okay. So I'm now going to talk about Mendelian versus complex traits. I promise this gets exciting in a minute. <laughs> Until you see the videos. Um, so when you talk about Mendelian disease, these are diseases that you either have the gene or you don't. So on this sort of map here, and you're saying, well, what gives me this disease? Well, Mendelian diseases are pretty much your genetics gives you the disease. Versus an infectious disease, say Ebola, where like if you it's in the environment, you're kind of got it regardless of what your genes are. And sitting in the middle of this are what's called complex traits. And complex traits are, gene, are diseases that you may have genetic susceptibility to it, but you also probably have environmental factors and other factors that have sort of tipped you over the edge to getting the disease. So an example of this is Alzheimer's, right? So there's no genetic test for Alzheimer's. Um, there's some genes that may predispose you to it more than others, but it's complex. There's a lot more going on. So this is um, my videos. <laughs> so wait for it. So this is our dog, and um, right now he's on the scale of being disease negative, all right? So he has no disease. So when you're talking about Mendelian diseases, right, you have a gene and it gives you the disease. So that mutation just pulled him over and now, now our dog is diseased. When you talk about complex diseases, which is a little bit more difficult, Essentially, you have a whole lot of genes that are kind of contributing together in sort of an additive effect, or Skittles, depending upon your perspective, and they, they contribute together to create a situation where you have a disease. But that's really not totally accurate. Because if you're a dog, you may have all those Skittles and all those gene mutations that are putting you in a position where you're susceptible, but there's gonna be something in the environment, e.g. milk bones, that might tip you over to getting the disease, right? So maybe obesity or, or you know, other environmental factors that really um, contribute to you getting that. So that's really the difference between monogenic or Mendelian traits and complex diseases. When we think about Mendelian disease, there's a number of examples of these in people like cystic fibrosis or Huntington's disease. There's a paper that came out in 2015 looking at canine idiopathic epilepsy, which is, um, a seizure disorder and idiopathic, again, meaning we don't know what causes it, um, where they used, whoop, getting ahead of myself, they used 157 cases and they had 179 controls. That may seem like a lot, but you have to realize that if this study was done in people, you'd have thousands, and we'll get to that. And essentially, they ended up doing a study, and, and what I want to talk about actually here is what, what this whole plot is, and so it's called a Manhattan plot, and I think it's because it's supposed to look like the Manhattan skyline. Um, but each one of these um, little dots here is a SNP. And along here, you've got your chromosomes. So all of these SNPs have been tested, and you're associating them versus dogs that have the disease and don't have the disease, and is there a difference? And then on the y-axis here is the p-value. And so what you can see is that, you know, you know, not really doing anything, there's not too much of a difference. And then suddenly on chromosome 37, it's like, whoop. Whoa, so there was something going on in chromosome 37, and in this area it formed what we call a volcano. So essentially there were SNPs that sort of came up, and then finally one that's like, hello. And that's tagging the, the disease. So another example of this was um, squamous cell carcinoma of the digit, so skin cancer on the toes, and it happens in a number of, um, a number of dogs. And this study, they ended up actually finding um, a mutation that causes this. And again, if you look at this, there's 31 cases and 34 controls. I mean, that's, that's very few, few dogs. But in this case, they used purebred standard poodles. 
um, scanned the genome using GWAS and ended up finding an area on chromosome 15 of interest and went further on and actually did find a mutation. Now what about complex diseases? So this gets a little bit trickier. So one of the, to me, most outstanding papers on complex disease that's come out came out in 2014 on schizophrenia. And what they found was 108 associated loci. So when you talk about there's a lot of different genes that contribute to this, this is what we're sort of discussing. And so this line here is their, their line of significance. What's particularly outstanding about this is that in order to do this study, they had, you know, however many million SNP markers and over 150,000 people in this study. When you think about how much data, energy, time, and money it takes to do that, it is absolutely outstanding. So if you have a dog model, you might be in a little bit better situation. So the key point here is that dogs really have a unique genomic architecture, and linkages to equilibrium in dogs, like we discussed, is a lot greater than it is in people. So again, you get smaller sample sizes, you have fewer markers. And we know that GWAS in dogs can be used successfully to identify um, regions of the genome that are associated with disease traits. And obviously, as a big bonus, if you ever create, find a disease marker in a dog that relates to a person, you now have a One Health situation to really benefit a lot of species. Okay, this is my take a drink time. So, getting back to laryngeal paralysis. It has a very strong breed predisposition, which really suggests a genetic basis. In veterinary medicine, it's very common that there are certain breeds that get certain diseases to the point where if you know the signalment, in other words, if you know the age, the gender, the neuter status, and the breed of dog, and someone tells you what the, the clinical presentation problem is, you're gonna have a pretty good idea of what's probably going on. I mean, there's always unicorns, but there's a lot of horses. So when you've got a breed that is very commonly gets a disease and no other dog breed really gets it, you have to be thinking to yourself, you know, this seems like it's probably something genetic. And when we look at pedigrees of dogs in this study, um, it really does indicate that laryngeal paralysis is heritable in, in the Labrador. So we've done um, a GWAS, and right now we've got 81 Labrador Retrievers. So we have 60 cases and 21 controls. And you'll understand why we have more cases and controls in a moment. But the cases, um, we're all seen at UW Veterinary Care. They received either surgical treatment um, for laryngeal paralysis, so they had that tie back surgery, or they had clinical signs that were very classic um, of the disease. And then we have 21 controls. And so these dogs are all, I think they're actually 12, but 11 and a half, 12 years of age. They've been checked with us at least twice. They have no signs of, of respiratory obstruction. They have no signs of progression of neurologic disease. So we're pretty confident that they, they won't be getting the disease. And all these dogs are screened, screened for relatedness. We get pedigrees from them. Um, and if there's any direct siblings, we exclude them. So just to throw a QQ plot at you, um, essentially this is, this is one of the ways of looking at our results. So what this is is an observed versus expected p-values. The basics of this is if you look at this line right here, let me move my mouse. This is what, and each one of these little dots are SNPs. All right, so these are all what we kind of expect the SNPs to be, and then suddenly at the top there's a few that break away because what we're observing is not what we expect because they're associated with the disease because they're different. And these SNPs all lining up along this line like this tells us that we have corrected statistically for relatedness of the dogs within the study. So I'm just giving you a little bit of our Manhattan plot because it's just one chromosome. Um, but what you can see here is that we've created this sort of, there's actually almost two volcanoes, but this is the one of interest. So there's sort of these volcanoes of SNPs coming up and there's one that's really um, significant. And this lies in an area of the genome that there's a number of genes that um, are pretty interesting that could be associated with um, neurologic disease. Perhaps more interestingly is when you look at our phenotype genotype table. So along this side, these are cases of so dogs that have the disease and these are controls. So like I said, we have 60 cases, we have 21 controls, we have a total of 81 dogs. And now we get back to our brown eyed, blue eyed. So you can have homozygous major, in other words, your big B, big B. All of our cases, or all dogs that have this a major allele have the disease. Then you've got heterozygous dogs, so 
big B, little b, or you know, your, your brown-eyed heterozygote. And in these, you got 28 cases and you have four, four controls. And then little b, little b, we'll get to in a minute. But what this map essentially really strongly indicates is that this is a dominant disease. So just like with brown eyes, if you have one of these big A alleles, there's a pretty good chance you're gonna get the disease. Now these homozygous minor alleles don't totally match up because there are a number of dogs that get the disease that you wouldn't expect to based on their genotype. And there's a lot of reasons this can happen with GWAS. So um, for instance, this SNP is probably tagging an area of the genome, but it's probably not the actual mutation that's causing the problem itself. This could be more than one disease. So just like in CMT, in Charcot Marie Tooth, where there's a lot of diseases with the common clinical picture, it's probably true in dogs too, that there's a lot of diseases that could have a common clinical picture. My hope is it's not true within a given breed, but it's certainly a possibility. You could also have a modifier locus. So in other words, a dog maybe needs to have this or this contributes to part of a disease, but there's actually something else happening nearby that is, that is either supporting it or preventing the disease from happening. So there's a lot of reasons why you could end up with dogs um, in this situation. The other issue is that our phenotyping might not be perfect. It can be difficult, especially earlier on in this disease, to be absolutely sure a dog has a condition, which is why we recheck these dogs fairly frequently. So what about the whole Labrador population? So fortunately, um, because we do a number of genetic studies on Labradors, we actually have a whole set of dogs' um, DNA that has gone through these SNP chips that are not associated with this study. And a lot of these dogs, admittedly are from the Madison and Wisconsin area, but they are actually nationwide. So we have about 210 additional dogs um, that aren't enrolled in this study that were not recruited for anything to do with laryngeal paralysis that are purebred Labradors. And if you look at their risk allele in this situation, you have the very unfortunate realization that this disease could be affecting even up to 70% of older Labradors. Now clinically, when you go into a hospital and you see a lot of old labs, that's not surprising. There are a lot of dogs that get this disease. So the key point is that we found a region in GWAS. It has a number of candidate genes, so we're really excited about that. Um, it does appear that this is an autosomal dominant trait, although we do need to do more statistical analysis on our pedigrees to really confirm that. And at least in the dogs that we have in our, lab, in our laboratory, um, you know, up to 70% of the population may be at risk of developing this disease in old age. So what's next? Um, well, we need to look at this region a little bit more. And so we've just started an um, experiment looking at whole genome sequencing, which is um, really exciting, with the hope of eventually not only identifying mutation, but potentially even being able to um, create some sort of a genetic test for this. We also need to evaluate this in other breeds. Because like I mentioned, could this be a clinical phenotype where you have laryngeal paralysis? It's actually the result of a number of different genotypes where there's more than one disease causing this problem. So overall, I hope that I've at least introduced you the idea of a comparative value between dogs and people um, with One Health Medicine, where dogs are really very valuable um, models for us. The huge benefit from a veterinary perspective is obviously if you find a disease in dogs and it applies to people, you know, you've got, you've got a, um, a, a strong funding source um, to continue to look at this in dogs, and, and you have a mutual benefit for both species. Um, I do need to disclose my um, funding. And uh, you know, it takes a village to raise me, so um, mm -hmm. you know, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and mentors, but particularly all the owners and participants which come from throughout the United States and Canada um, and mail, mail in their DNA and help us out um, beyond what I can um, describe to you. Um, I'd like to thank you, and uh, I can take any questions you might have. question. Um, you can isolate stem cells in dogs, and that has been looked at, but um, really there's not much evidence at this point of using it in this kind of condition, and we don't even know what we would target yet. 
Um, I mean, how do you target a peripheral neuropathy? There's not really a site that you could necessarily even inject them. And I think the way stem cells work um, is still something that is uh, really being discovered in a lot of ways. So um, certainly if it was an inflammatory disease, an autoimmune disease, that would be particularly interesting because stem cells have a lot of anti-inflammatory properties. Um, but uh, yeah, we're a little bit a ways away from, from getting to that point yet. Yeah. That's a really good question. I think certain breeds, it potentially could. So if you look at something like a golden retriever where there's a very smaller subset of the population that gets it, you could potentially take those dogs out of the breeding phase. The problem with Labrador is if you have a disease that's affecting say 50% of the population, you can't, I mean you could, but you don't want to take 50% of the breeding population out because then you're just taking an inbred group of dogs and making them more inbred. Um, so really for Labradors in particular, finding a disease modifying therapy or finding ways of intervening earlier on is probably going to be a bigger solution for us. Yeah. Yeah. So you have fewer sniffs in dogs than people. Mm -hmm. That means the chunks you guys are eating are bigger. Yes. So now we can Oh, my fatal flaw. <laughs> Yeah, so that's where things like whole genome sequencing comes in. Um, so there's been a number, in the past, there's been a number of different methods of sort of dissecting out those regions. And when you're talking about, you know, a, a million SNPs on either side, or, you know, in total, that's a lot to look at. So that's where looking at um, the whole genome data, which is very rapidly evolving. And fortunately, um, we collaborate with a group at the NIH that has a, um, they're working on a thousand dog genome project right now. Actually, I think they're doing 10,000, but um, that are able to help us um, sort of suss through this whole genome data and look at it in a little bit more detail. But prior to that, there's a lot of Sanger sequencing and um, PCR and, you know, trying to find small SNP, there's small areas and milk them together, but whole genome sequencing, fortunately, has become cheap enough that we can afford it. Yeah? What's the most dying, I mean, how does the diagnosis that there's a neuropathy or uh, involved with some symptoms? Yeah, I think it's what you're saying. Um, so how are neuropathies diagnosed? Yeah, I mean, you, you, there could be a number of dis different diseases or that could, could cause the same symptoms. And yeah, yeah, so that's where really trying to figure out the genetics of it becomes important. So um, in people, if you look at Charcot Marie Tooth, they used to do nerve biopsies and muscle biopsies and um, electrodiagnostics and a lot of different things to try to suss out, is this a demyelinating disease? Is this an axonopathy? Like what, what's the underlying pathology of the disease? And really when um, genetic testing became more available, that greatly accelerated the ability to diagnosis. So for the most part in people, it's a genetic diagnosis. That's what we're trying to create more in dogs. Yeah. yeah. So are they using CRISPR technology to do genetic modification based on um, CRISPR for like dog breeding? No, we're, we're a little ways away from that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, you, see, you see pictures of uh, CRISPR technology being used to help uh, dog breed muscles. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, could you do something like that? Maybe, but it's pretty cro cost prohibitive from a, you know, here's Fido, my family dog. Um, now, they're. 70% of them. Yeah, when you're talking about 70% of them, it's a lot. So, that's where, you know, if you can find mutations or if that technology develops more, you know, maybe that would be an option. Um, but really, hopefully, if we could find some sort of treatment for this, like I said, not only in dogs, but for people, too, it would be huge. Um, but yeah. yeah. What type of technology are we talking about here? If you want to describe it. Uh, Yeah, so the first thing to realize is that when you look at sort of maps of relatedness or dog breed creation, obviously retrievers, so golden retrievers, Labrador retrievers, and flat-coated retrievers are all very closely related. I've unfortunately come to the realization that goldens are not long-haired labs. So there are some goldens that present very similarly to Labradors, but there are also a subset of goldens that really present in a slightly different way, which 
um, is one of these things when you stare at these dogs long enough, you begin to realize that maybe there's some differences. And um, so my answer to your question is, my suspicion is that some Goldens may have a disease that's similar to labs, but I really have a, have a feeling that it may be a different condition in Goldens. So at this point, if we can work with Labradors and then apply it to Goldens, who have the condition, that's actually going to tell us a lot um, where, you know, is it in the Labradors or is it not? Um, the disease does occur sporadically in other breeds as well. Um, so I've certainly seen it in Poodles, um, I've seen it in Springers, I've seen it in um, Airedales, and so it does occur occasionally. But clinically, when you look at those dogs, they're not always very typical. I mean, these labs are very classic in the way they present. And when you look at other breeds, they're not always just that classic, you know, laryngeal paralysis Labrador. So, yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah. So, um, do, um, are, are toy dogs protected from this just because their, their length of their nerves is shorter? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. We generally don't see this in toy dogs. I had we sometimes there are some small breed dogs that do come in with laryngeal paralysis. Um, there's another condition in toy dogs called laryngeal collapse that can look relatively similar. But I have seen some small dogs with laryngeal paralysis. But again, is that the same disease? You know, I don't I don't really know. Um, but that's a very sporadic um, situation, and I'm a little biased because I think at the university we see everything that's weird. Um, so toy dogs with laryngeal paralysis is probably not very common. And it's probably something that gets shipped to the university. Um, so hopefully they're protected. Um, I would personally consider them a fairly protected breed, but they can't get it. Any questions? Any questions? If not, thank you very much.